Deep Learners. I'm Andrew Ng, founder of DeepLearning.ai, and I'm excited to welcome you to our global deep learning community. I know that many of you are here today because you want to break into AI and build your career. I hope that being part of this community will help you to do so. To give you a proper welcome, I'd like to show you around the DeepLearning.ai offices and meet some of the team so you can see where it all happens. Oh, hi, Andrew. You want to tell our friends at Pine AI what you do at DeepLearning.ai? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, I make articles and other media that help people learn about AI and help them understand the huge impact that AI is having on the world. Today, I'm putting together the next issue of The Batch, our weekly newsletter, and I'm looking for the biggest stories of the week to keep our readers informed. What's been the most surprising thing you've heard about this week that's been lurking on the batch? How much is going on in this community? There is never a dull moment. I, you know, you might think from the outside that machine learning engineers really understand everything about AI, but nobody understands everything about AI because this field is just coming to life right before my eyes as I put this thing together every week. All right, I know you're reading this in some. I should get back to you. Thanks. See you later. Let's go meet Kian, who helped me create the deep learning specialization. He's working on an exciting new project. Hey Kian, so do you want to tell the people at Time AI what you're working on? Yes, sure. Uh, I'm using a project called Gartera, uh, focusing on helping uh, people get offers in AI and navigating their career by uh, testing their skills. Uh, preparing for interviews and certifying them, as well as uh, matching and referring them to good jobs in AI. That's really cool. And what's the most exciting part of your day? You know, the AI field is new, uh, organizations and jobs are still misunderstood. So I'm excited to help people understand what different types of jobs exist in the field, uh, what tasks they will work on, and what skills are needed to achieve those tasks. That's really important work. Well, it's nice chatting. And now let's go chat with Morel, who is on the product team. Hey, Andrew. Do you want to say hi to our friends at Pine AI and let them know what you're working on? I would love to. Hi, everyone. I lead the product team in deeplearning.ai, where we create AI education content accessible to people all around the world. People like you. And what are you most excited about right now? I am so excited to see our community grow and to see how eager people are to learn more about AI. Thanks also. Thank you. So as you can see, our team is working hard to support you and help you learn. It's never been easier than before to break into AI. So if you want to build a career, you can leverage online resources available, including open source code, data sets, papers, and online courses like the deep learning specialization on Coursera. As part of this journey, I hope you get your hands dirty too. Don't be afraid of diving in to build your own project, or go ahead and try to replicate a research paper that you're excited about. One thing that I've seen help a lot of people succeed is if you can build a community or find a community of fellow deep learners you can meet with and study with on a regular basis. In fact, I hope that this high AI meetup that you're at right now will be a good place for you to meet these people. I hope you enjoyed the event today and that you learn a lot both from the talks and from each other. And once again, welcome to the deep learning AI community. Yeah, I think uh, that was our first sponsor. We have our second sponsor now. I think Melinda, if you want yeah. to say a few words. Cool. Thanks, Georg. Um, yes, I'm Melinda from Rockstar Recruiting. Um, basically, we're a Zurich based um, recruiting spin off from um, Uni Zurich and help yeah, great tech talents find good jobs and companies find the right tech talent, um, especially in data science machine learning um, environment so basically if, if you want to get in touch and looking for a new job or um, the right candidate um, just get in touch i actually would like to talk about three 
positions we currently have that might be interesting to some of you guys if you're looking um, right now. So one is a special position. It's an exclusive uh, mandate in Hamburg for a fast moving consumer goods startup um, where they're looking for a VP for engineering and data to build up a team. Um, that's number one. Um, the second one is uh, build up a team as head of machine learning um, for a spin out of one of Switzerland's biggest retail companies. Um, and the last one is um, a data engineer with JavaScript experience for um, a Swiss consulting company. Um, basically, if you find it yourself in those positions, feel free to, to get in touch. But also, if you want to have a chat about the Swiss market, about finding a job here, happy to answer, answer questions. And yeah, All right. thanks for, for giving us the, the time to uh, present us in the beginning and have a good event, everyone. All right, and uh, so to the main content, we are three minutes behind schedule. Um, we have the talk of uh, Nuria. Um, she's going to talk about, well, something obviously reinforcement learning. And as I understand it, it's uh, uh, something about her master's thesis that she did. And um, I think, uh, I mean, most of the introductions on the meetup page that everyone's read. So uh, she's working at ETH uh, at the moment. And um, yeah, I think I hand over to Nuria now. Yeah, okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, so I am Nuria. Thanks, Gerrit, for this nice introduction. Um, so yeah, I think uh, I can get started with the talk. So let me uh, share my screen. Yeah, so yeah, good afternoon, everybody. So thanks uh, yeah, for this nice introduction. And thanks for everybody for attending this talk. And so in this talk, as the title implies, I'll try to give some insights on how to build complex uh, risk-averse decision-making engines. Uh, and more specifically, I'll talk on how I did model one of those as part of my master thesis that I did at the University of ETH in Zurich. So in this talk, I decided to uh, organize it a bit like following my learning process that I did uh, throughout the thesis. So that despite that we might all come from different backgrounds, we can all grow uh, our knowledge on the topic. And hence, at the end, eventually, we will all be able to understand this new algorithm that I want to talk about today. Um, so yeah, so let's start with a bit of a motivation of why I, I, I wanted to do research on this topic for my master thesis. So the thing is that we are entering a new era of autonomy on, and when we are seeing more and more frequently agents such as robots, healthcare devices, or even cars with some sort of autonomy that ideally will try to improve our daily lives and improve by it, us by improve our life by um, helping us commute more efficiently to work, maybe help us with some household activities or even to advise our doctors on how to, which is our, the best healthcare treatment for us. So when interacting with the real world environment, these agents will encounter different amount of uncertainties, such as different weather conditions on the road or different room setups for the cleaning robot, uh, which are inherent in this real world formulation. And so we will all agree that in all these cases that I, ju I just mentioned, safety is crucial. So it is essential that the agent is sensitive to risks and uncertainties in the world uh, so that we avoid catastrophic events. So mainly the idea of my thesis was try to do some research so that we can develop algorithms for resensitive reinforcement learning so that we can end up creating agents that uh, help us as uh, help human society but most importantly, that be, they behave in a safe way. But yeah, let's go a bit into the basics. Uh, so reinforcement learning uh, is mainly learning what to do or how to act so as to maximize a numerical reward uh, signal. So uh, wait, I just, ah, OK, sorry, I was just checking the, the chat. Uh, OK. So uh, sorry, so yeah, reinforcement learning is learning what to do or how to act so as to maximize a numerical reward signal. So the learner is not told which actions to take, but instead must discover which actions yield to the maximum, the most reward by trying them out. So in the standard, in the standard reward reinforcement learning setting, we have an agent that interacts with an environment and then it sends the state of the environment by via this state's S 
and decided which actions to take uh, so that to maximize this numerical reward signal or so as to uh, um, solve a task. And then after he acted on the environment via these actions A, it will receive a reward that the, uh, will tell the agent how good was this action so, in the direct, so that to solve the task. So we, what we actually want, need to do in reinforcement learning is try to learn a controller or what's called in this uh, reinforcement learning literature to learn a policy that will tell the agent which actions to take given that he's, or he senses that he's an, in state S. So more theoretically, the goal of this agent is try to find an optimal policy by star that will maximize the expected value of the sum of rewards that the agent will gather throughout uh, the task. So for example, uh, to example, let's imagine that we have this robot that works in a warehouse and needs to bring a package to this track that we have here at, the, uh, at this side. Um, so we would mainly like to learn a policy that tells the robot that at each uh, position in the space, uh, whether to turn right, to move forward, to, to turn left, left or whatever, so that we reach uh, the goal as fast as possible and also avoiding uh, colliding with, up, uh, with the obstacles. So mainly the ideal, go the ideal trajectory would be, be something like that. Mm, so uh, approaches towards R RL, we could mm, define that there's like two main approaches. So one is model-based and the other ones are model-free approaches. So in model-based, we first learn the dynamics, a dynamics model of the environment so that we estimate the consequences of the actions on the environment. And then we use this model that we learn to plan or do some optimal control. Whereas in the other approach, in the model-free approach, the dynamics are not explicitly modeled, but instead we, the optimal policy that's parameterized at some parameters theta is learned directly by interaction with the environment. And then we solve a global optimization so that to uh, optimize this uh, learnable parameters theta. And in this talk, we'll focus on these approaches in the model-free approaches um, that actually they are generally much simpler than the model-based ones but the amount of data that they require is about one or two orders of magnitude bigger than the model-based counterparts, which in general means that millions of interactions with the environment will be required for uh, a task to be solved. So more visually, that would mean that we would, to learn a task, we would need to take our robot into the real world and keep trying out different actions so that we get to know the consequences of those actions and then based on the information that we gather from the environment, mainly the rewards that we gather from the environment, we would uh, use this information to update or to improve our policy. However, the problem is that in the standard reinforcement learning setting, there is no notion of safety. So uh, at early stages of training, our poorly acquainted policy might let the robot try some actions that are very detrimental. So for example, back to this warehouse example, uh, the policy at some point at early stages of training might, might let the, tell the robot to try moving forward here, right? And then we would collide and we, we want to avoid that. So to address this issue, there's an alternative data-driven paradigm of reinforcement learning, which is called offline RL, that has recently gained a lot of popularity as a viable path towards effective uh, real-world reinforcement learning. And uh, offline reinforcement learning requires learning skills only from a previously and fixed collected data set without any further interaction with environment while training. So mainly somebody else, we, we record some data uh, that we, uh, we don't care about how they do that, but then they would give us this data and we would only use this data to train our algorithm. So using this offline reinforcement learning framework, we would solve this problem of active data interaction and poor performance of our policies at the early stages of training. However, all the existing algorithms that exist for offline reinforcement learning are risk neutral. So the final policy that we would end up learning is still not accounting for the risks of actions taken. So, uh, so more theoretically, the objective of a risk neutral reinforcement learning algorithm is to find a policy by a star that maximizes the expected value of the, the sum of rewards gathered throughout an episode 
but is not caring about anything else of the distribution rather than the expected value. So having here, for example, the, the probability density function of the return or the sum of the rewards, a risk neutral approach uh, actually focuses on finding policies that, yeah, that maximize the expected value and tries to shift to the right this value, which is called, also called the Q value, but it still might perform very poorly in some cases. Um, I mean, however, in very in risky applications, rather than focusing on this average performance, we would like to do risk sensitive or risk averse decision making and hence, and hence focus more on the tail of the distribution and, and try to shift to the right some other metric uh, rather than the expected value. And mainly we would focus in the, in the worst case scenario that could happen in the episode. So maybe to visualize a little bit more the difference between the kind of policies that the risk neutral and a risk sensitive approach would, would learn. Uh, and uh, let's go back to this warehouse example and I hope I'm not overusing it too much. So let's assume that with some very low probability, like maybe once a year, there's some construction site happening here in the middle of the warehouse. And let's assume as well that we don't want to change the trajectory. Uh, so we want to keep the trajectory constant every day in the year. So maybe the risk neutral approach would say, well, if that happens with such a low probability, uh, maybe I actually don't really care that, that something happens once in a year, right? So maybe I still want to go to, to use this fastest path towards my uh, end goal. And because in terms of the average performance, that is, that's the best I could do, right? So if in some cases, I, some collision happens here, well, in terms of the average performance, I would still be optimal by, by following this trajectory. Whereas risk sensitive approach would be more sensible, would say, well, I might sacrifice a bit of average performance by taking a, 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 like a longest path, but I will make sure that there's never a catastrophic event happening. So um, there's already some um, algorithms that are try to combine risk sensitive uh, criteria with reinforcement learning, but they all suffer from, they all have some disadvantages. So first of all, they are on policy. So again, we would have this problem that at the early stages of training, our policy performs very bad, and then we would have catastrophic events. Secondly, they are generally, they use stochastic policies which are not very natural in many applications. Then additionally, they suffer from high variance. So the way in which these uh, algorithms are trained is that they required whole system trajectories for this training process. And hence, when these trajectories are very long, they might, uh, the algorithm might suffer from high variance. And finally, they are very sample inefficient. So actually in general, in general terms, what these algorithms do is that they, they collect these uh, long trajectories, but then they only keep the trajectories whose return is below a certain threshold. So imagine that they collected uh, 100 trajectories and then the threshold is a 0.1 threshold. So we will only be able to make use of 10 trajectories out of all these 100. So generally these uh, algorithms, they actually waste a lot of samples. So to solve all these aforementioned disadvantages, uh, we, I'm gonna introduce an algorithm, which is actually the first approach towards learning a risk sensitive uh, policy, risk averse policy using only offline data. And actually this algorithm led to the recent publications in both the workshop in offline AVL at NURIPS 2020, and the iClear conference that will happen in May 2021. And it was done by me, by, master by my master thesis supervisor, Sebastian Curry, who is a PhD at the Learning and Adaptive System Group, where I did my master thesis, and which is led by Professor Andreas Krause. So the algorithm I'm gonna introduce is called ORAC, standing for Offline Risk Covers Active Critic. So by now I already introduced these uh, first two terms, so offline and risk averse. And let's now uh, focus on this last term, actor critic, uh, and let's spend some few minutes in understanding what actor critic means, because I think it's gonna make it easy for all of us to understand the whole algorithm later on. So actor critic algorithms are well-known algorithms in reinforcement learning that they combine the basic ideas from policy gradients and approximate dynamic programming. 
So they mainly have two components, an actor and a critic, which are all parameterized using some function approximators with some learnable parameters, theta and w in this case. So the actor is mainly the policy. So it will tell us which actions to take given that we are in a state S. And the critic is the value function. So it will give us an approximation of the expected value of the return that we will gather if we we, if given at the state S and taking action A and that after all uh, following policy by. So we need to learn these parameters theta and W. And the way these actor critical algorithms work is that they keep iterating between two phases, namely a policy evaluation phase and a policy improvement phase. So in the policy evaluation part, we try to uh, improve our critic estimate. So we try to update the parameters W so that we get a better estimate of these expected values of some of rewards that we would gather by following policy by. Whereas in the second uh, phase, the policy improvement, as the name says, we try to improve our policy. So we update our uh, theta parameters so that we get, uh, uh, so that we maximize this uh, Q function. So mainly, yeah, we keep iterating between these spaces. We try to approximate better this Q function under current policy pi. Then we improve our policy pi. And then we try to approximate better, again, our Q function, given that we change it slightly, this uh, policy. And yeah, so I just wanted to emphasize. So here, I just kept mentioning expected values and Q values and so on. But again, our goal, as discussed previously, is to maximize some other metric rather than the expected value that focuses more on the tail of the distribution. So yeah, um, uh, I'll explain. So we would need to to we would need to um, design some variation of these uh, standard actor critical algorithms so that we can can account for this, and I'll explain that in a moment. So yeah, I think that by now we are all familiar with all the terms of the algorithm. And now I'll proceed to explain how uh, OREC works. So as we can see, it, uh, it's composed by three main components. And all these components have as an input this fixed data set buffer that is in here and in all offline uh, reinforcement learning uh, settings. So as we can see, the first component is the critic, which is in charge of learning the full value distribution here shown in red. And the second component is the actor, which is a risk averse component and is in charge of generating actions that maximize some uh, risk distortion operator D uh, of this value distribution. So mainly it generates actions that are less risky. And finally, in blue, we have this variational autoencoder, which is an imitation learner component that, that is in charge of generating actions that have high similarity to the ones in the data set. So this is a very important component in the whole algorithm because it will help us solving some difficulties that arise due to the offline nature of the algorithm. And I will explain a little bit more on that later. So mainly what for now we need to understand is that after training, the workflow works as follows. So the actions that are generated by this variational autoencoder are then perturbed by this uh, risk averse component so that we end up creating actions that are risk averse. But yeah, let's proceed to explain a little bit more in detail all the three components. So first of, first of all, is we have the critic, which is a distributional critic, uh, as introduced by Belemar in 2017. So this critic is in charge of learning the full uh, value distribution. So not only the expected value, but the whole distributions of uh, distribution of returns for every state and action pay. Um, so to represent this value distribution, we will adapt an approach presented by Daphne in 2018, in which they chose to represent this distribution implicitly through its quantile function or inverse cumulative distribution function. And we chose to use this approach because as we will see later, many risk distortion operators can be efficiently computed using uh, such representation. So mainly the inverse cumulative distribution function or quantile function maps us from probabilities tau to quantiles or values of the return. So mainly it specifically gives us the value of the return for which the probability of getting such a, a value or less than that is exactly tau. 
or maybe even more visually for some of you, uh, the, the quantile it, it we will it, the quantile function will give us the return the value of the return for which the area under this probability density function from minus infinity to this value z it's exactly tau. So whatever it's easier for you to understand, we would actually use this representation to uh, rep yeah to represent this value distribution, and to yeah to represent this quantile function, I will use this variable uh, z that is actually parameterized through a neural network with these learnable parameters w. So then given this triplet confidence level tau, state s and action a, we will learn the mapping to the value of the return at the desired quantile level tau. And then to learn these parameters w so that to get a good approximation of this value distribution at every state and action pair, we would mainly need to do this uh, phase of po the policy evaluation phase, mainly that I introduced uh, earlier. So, and to do so, to learn these parameters W, we will exploit this distribution of Bellman equation of returns that actually builds upon this well-known recursive Bellman equation for the scalar setting. So we mainly can use um, this equation that stays, says that the two random variables at the two uh, sides of the equality actually have the same probability laws. So then this equation would uh, let us to be able to learn these weights uh, of the critic via distributional variant of a fit, of fitted value iteration, and then using the quantile over loss on the temporal difference errors. Okay, so I already explained the first uh, component, and let's proceed uh, to the second one, uh, which is the actor for the risk averse component. So, this is going to be also parameterized through a neural network with learnable parameters theta. And so again, um, while risk neutral approaches try to find a policy phi that maximizes the expected value, our goal that it's risk averse, we will try to find a policy that maximizes some other measure d that accounts of a measure of the risk of the actions taken if we follow such a policy phi. So there are several risk measures, but we will mainly focus on one of those that's the most common risk measure in the literature, which is called the conditional value at risk, or also known as the CBER. Although uh, for the, um, we can also use other risk measures with this algorithm that we propose. But yeah, what's this conditional value at risk? So the CBER of a distribution at a confidence level alpha is the expected value of the tail of this distribution. So the tail is this green shaded region. And uh, we define the tail as the, all the area lying below the alpha quantile. So as before I introduced already the quantile that we would, it would lie here. So the CBER is actually the expected value lying below this quantile. And so how to compute this risk distortion D though? So, in most of the algorithms that exist for risk sensitive RBEL and that they try to optimize the CBER too, the way in which they choose to represent this value distribution makes the computation of this risk, risk distortion operator D uh, very computationally expensive, sample inefficient, and generally has a high variance. But in our case, we can leverage the quantile representation that we use for the critic or for the value distribution to represent this value distribution, and hence we can actually approximate this desired risk distortion D via sampling from an associated quantile distribution PD. So we mainly need to evaluate our quantile function at these quantile levels that we sample from this distribution. And actually, in the particular case of the CBER, this distribution PD is well known. So it's the uniform distribution from zero to alpha. So hence that means that we can efficiently approximate the CBER at the quantile level alpha using this sample-based scheme. So we evaluate the quantile function at the quantile level sampled uniformly from zero to alpha. And that's very efficient and yeah, it's not computationally expensive at all. And then to learn this risk averse actor or to learn the parameters theta of this risk averse actor, we, would, we are now lying on this policy improvement phase of this actor critic algorithm. And hence what we need to do is mainly sample states from the fixed data set that we have for training, compute the CBER, and then updating the parameters theta via gradient ascent in the direction of maximizing the, the CBER. Okay, so at this point, we already have a theoretically sufficient uh, uh, algorithm uh, to learn a risk averse policy. 
And now actually, if you check the, out the paper, uh, uh, if you check out the paper, you can see that actually we show some examples in which we already proved that we already designed the risk averse policy only by using these two components. However, when we move to the offline setting, some difficulties arise. And that's why we introduced this new component uh, to uh, solve, solve these issues. So uh, the problem is uh, these problems that or difficulties that arise, actually they have been recently studied uh, because it, it happened that when the researchers tried to use these standard enforcement learning algorithms that already existed for a lot of time, they tried to use those algorithms for offline RL, they realized that they failed to learn. And this is due to some fundamental problems in offline RL, and I'll focus on one of the most important ones that's called the bootstrapping error. So the problem is that when we are training without the ability to collect new data, we can only make use of the data that, that, we, that is provided in the data set, here shown as these purple dots. So we can hence get a, quite a good approximate of the Q function when we evaluate this Q function at these, uh, uh, at these purple dots, at these actions that are in the data set. So as we can see that here we have the estimated Q function in blue, and in dash green, we have the true Q function under the behavior policy. So we can see that they quite match a lot. However, the accuracy of the Q estimate on actions that have never been seen in the training set are very in control. So if the distribution of actions induced by, induced by the policy that we are learning differs a lot from the behavior policy, when we are updating the Q estimate via bootstrapping, we can easily end up querying the Q function at such and seen actions, and that might lead to very erroneous Q values that are used for the backups. So since no correction step is possible because we cannot interact with the environment and realize that our prediction was very wrong, this generally overestimation errors gets farther and farther accumulated on the new, uh, on the updated uh, Q estimates that then leads to very pathological values and even divergence. So to address these out of distribution actions and effectively be able to implement risk sensitive offline RL, we introduce this third component. So this third component is a variational autoencoder and it's mainly an imitation learner component that is in charge of learning a generative model of the behavior policy and hence outputs actions that have high similarity to the ones in the data set. So we make sure that we won't be, we will never be querying actions that are very far away. So hence the final uh, actor policy can be decomposed into main components. So an imitation learning component that tries to reduce the bootstrapping error, and then a risk averse component that's implemented how, uh, as I introduced earlier, um, that is in charge of perturbing the actions generated by the imitation learner in the direction of maximizing the desired risk averse criteria. And then we, fi we finally have, uh, uh, have lambda, that's an hyperparameter that scales the perturbation magnitude. Okay, so I think now we can already proceed into the experiments. So we tried to evaluate, we, or we evaluated the performance of our al algorithm on the D4RL data set, which was uh, presented by Fu in 2020, which consists of tons of pre-collected data on uh, multiple tasks. So mainly the, the people who generated these data sets, they, they collected data using some agents, they collected and recorded the data, and then they give it to us so that we can do our offline training. So we use three Moyoko tasks, namely the half Shita, the Walker, and the Hopper. And for each of these tasks, we chose the medium and the expert data set types. And so these data set types means how good in terms of performance was the agent when collecting the data for the data set. So when these, uh, yeah, when these people that collect, made the data set was collecting the data, they decided how much mm -hmm. they were training the agents for the, for the data set collection. So mainly the expert was agent that were super expert on the task and mediums, well, they were not great yet. So since the reward function in Muyoko is deterministic, we incorporated the stochasticity into the original reward function to have a meaningful assessment of risk. 
So for example, in the case of the Shita, we try to model the risk of the Shita crashing because it was speeding too much. And hence we modify the regional reward function uh, by adding with some very low probability, 0 0.1, a penalty in the case that the sheet exceeds a speed limit uh, v hat. Whereas in the case of the walker and the hopper, we try to model the risk of the agent falling forwards or backwards. And hence we again modify the regional reward function by adding with some penalty 0 0.1, uh, I, with some probability 0 0.1, a penalty in the case that the pitch angle of the agent exceeds a speed uh, threshold angle theta hat. I, sorry, exceeds a pitch angle uh, uh, theta hat. Okay, so in the first experiment, we, we intended to demonstrate the effectiveness of our algorithm as a risk averse learner in this offline setting. And here in this table, what I want to show is that we actually compared uh, ORAC optimizing a risk distortion, the CBER as a risk distortion at a quantum level 0 0.1. We compared it to different benchmarks. So namely, uh, ORAC optimizing other risk distortions, uh, some competing risk averse uh, algorithms, some state-of-the-art risk neutral algorithms, some ablations, and the behavior policy. And we can see that for all the three tasks and for both data set types, medium and expert, uh, our algorithm uh, or ORAC has higher CBER than the benchmarks. And maybe it can be more visually seen by also showing this qualitative evaluation of the risk averse performance by looking at the support of the risk events. So here we can see the frequency of different velocities in the case of the Halshita and the frequency of different pitch angles in the case of the Walker and the Hopper. Then in shaded green, we show uh, the safe region or just the region where there is no penalty. And in purple, we show the behavior policy. So we can see that most of the support of the, of the behavior policy actually lies out of this uh, safe region. Whereas when we look at the support induced by ORAC, in blue, we can see that it actually learned to shift the distribution to the safe area. And also if we look in the, the purple distribution, which is a risk neutral algorithm, we can see that it actually ignored the large but rare penalties, and it actually imitates the behavior policy, having most of its support as well in the risky region. And then uh, the second and last experiment, we also evaluated whether it was beneficial to optimize a risk averse criteria in the offline setting, when actually we want to maximize a risk neutral criteria. So mainly we train ORAC using a risk averse metric, but then we evaluate on the average value of the returns. So mainly we look again at the same table, but now we focus on the column that shows the mean of the returns. And actually we can see that again, we, in all three tasks and both medium and expert types, uh, ORAC has a higher or better or, or similar uh, mean uh, to the benchmarks. So this indicates that actually optimizing a risk averse performance is beneficial to maximize a risk neutral criterion. And this might be due to these distributional robust properties that risk sensitive criteria has. So actually this can be more seen in, in data sets where the data is not very diverse. So mainly, especially in the expert data because the data, the expert is very, uh, the actions that he took, they are very concentrated on performing uh, very well. And hence we can see that we, when we compare with Bear, for example, uh, here, which is a risk neutral algorithm, Actually, uh, our uh, or a algorithm uh, performs much better. So finally, we can visually show performance uh, on the half sheet task for the medium data set type. And we compare our algorithm with uh, OD4PG, which is a risk neutral algorithm. And we can see that while uh, uh, OD4PG ignores the high but rare penalizations and, and runs as fast as it can, Actually, ORAC accounts for it and keeps breaking so that it never exceeds the speed limit. And secondly, uh, we also show performance on the worker task for the expert variant. And we compare it to BEAR, which is a state-of-the-art risk neutral offline uh, algorithm. And we can see that again, while BEAR ignores the high but rare penalization due to exceeding the pitch angle threshold, ORAC accounts for it that has a and has a much narrower, much narrower range of pitch angles. 
Okay, so we reach into the conclusions. So we just show the first fully offline algorithm for risk sensitive array that is compatible with many risk averse criteria that uh, outperforms algorithms in terms of risk averse performance. And it, that's competitive with uh, risk neutral algorithms in terms of risk neutral performance. Um, so yeah, I think uh, I'll reach now the end of my talk. And just as a reminder, if you have still interest on the paper or on the algorithm, you can read the full paper because it's available at, publicly at archive. And also if you want to check out the code or play with it or whatever, you can also get it uh, because it's publicly available uh, on GitHub. So yeah, uh, thank you so much for your attention. And now I'm open to answer any questions that you may have. Okay. So um, I was just wondering, are you gonna continue with this topic now after your uh, masters or, yeah. Um, yeah, so now I am, well, I guess everybody learned, uh, read the description, but so I'm now working as a scientific assistant in, uh, in the lab at ETH. Uh, where I'll also start my PhD uh, there. Uh, it's the Computational Robotics Lab, uh, TTH. And yeah, they actually, they focus more on the practical applications. So, uh, and they are interested in trying to implement this uh, algorithm actually for real uh, robotic tasks. So um, yes, so I'll probably we I'll continue, continue doing research on that. Okay, and I think you have answered already the first question. There is one. Do you want to read it or? Ah, uh, so it's it ah uh, oh yeah sure. Just came in. Anyway. Is there already ah um so not yet. Uh, I mean that's what we are actually planning to do now, but uh, we haven't yet uh, um, tried it out yet. Yes. Okay, so there's no one like Boston Dynamics or something buying the whole technology or something. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet, okay. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> <That's fun. laughs> okay, um, yeah, so I don't see any further questions. I mean, now would be the time to answer them. I don't have any waiting music. Okay, it's just a thank you from, from Roland. <laughs> okay, yeah. and um, yeah, I mean, now would probably be the time to, to do an apro if it were in person somewhere. But uh, yeah, it's well, it's still impossible now. I think that one of the next meetups is going to be in person again, somewhere in Zurich. Oh, and okay. Yeah, Good definitely going to be nicer. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't have a lot of questions. I mean, I have a lot of questions, but uh, I don't know. It was really a lot, a lot coming through on, on this talk. Just oh, okay. Now sometimes I just, I just lost track of, of what's actually going on. But I mean, that's just normal. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll do my best, but yeah. yeah. There is one more question just now. Is it? Uh, okay. From Priam. Uh, can this work be combined to save policy gradients? Uh, like which, I don't know which exactly algorithm in policy gradients uh, are you thinking of? I think we can elevate our, her to Unmute and I'm not sure. Or is Priya, are you, Priya, are you going to continue with the questioning? Or okay, and Priya cannot talk, so we're probably going to. Uh, there, there's another question that, that just came in from Ryan, and maybe Priya can uh, reformulate her question. I don't know. And there's actually two questions from Ryan. So, um, how do you stop offline RL just essentially becoming imitation learning? And um, also second one, so maybe we yeah, could I, that. Sorry, now we can, ah, two questions. How do you stop offline sorry. array just essentially becoming mutation learning? Not extremely positive opportunity to do. Um, well, so it's not exactly mutation learning. So for example, in this case, uh, so we had some part that was uh, some imitation learner component, but then you can also, Try to add some components that they not they not only focus on on imitation the the, the actions in the training data set but try to optimize something else so that uh, you it's you are not restricting uh, the actions to be clones of the actions in the data set. Um, 
it also depends on so in the in this imitation learner uh, using this variation auto encoder and to auto encoder it, it's quite restrictive the the like the constraints that you put on the actions that you will generate but then there's bear for example that they are the constraints they put on the actions are uh, are not so strict as when using a variation auto encoder so uh, yeah of of course you need always to limit so it, that you don't have these bootstrapping errors and you query actions that uh, are super far away from the ones in the data set but uh, you can still be able to generalize and not be uh, cloning all the time uh, i don't know if i explain more yeah probably sound good for the for the first question the second one is one How about the situations where when performing yeah. on policy and life system the distribution differs from that of train so it actually so as you as you if you saw for example this graph that i was showing uh in which i show that we actually learned to shift the distribution uh, so it's actually there is actually there is a distributional shift happening but in this case it was actually beneficial to maximize this new reward function that we uh that we shaped or that we modified so um yeah i hope that is also uh answers okay i think that you answered the first question well that's what he said in the chat and uh yeah i don't know the second one made sense to me as well and there is um a title of the paper coming in from from priam yeah. the upon of base safe policy, safe policy condition for continuous control um okay so um probably these so I, 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 I'm not familiar with it, but I guess that it must be uh, uh, for online or off policy uh, algorithm, uh, but definitely there's, a, so ah, is it maybe from um, a guy from ETH actually this uh, for from Felix that can come the paper, I'm not sure, but anyway, so, um, it sounds that it's from Felix can come, but I'm not sure. So um, yeah, definitely could be a way to combine somehow the algorithms. Uh, so yeah, but I, I I'm not so completely familiar on this, so I'm not sure how I would do so. But definitely, there's uh, always ways to check where are the objectives of each of the algorithms and then try to um, combine them to, for a some other purpose okay i found the paper but it's you don't know i don't know i don't know the author the authors jin Lim chow uh, oh sorry yeah i actually didn't oh, okay so it's not from some Felix. Uh. okay <laughs> let <laughs> i wait i'll ah ah from show okay okay yeah. i know uh Okay, so yeah, I didn't read this one. Um, so I, I, I'm sorry, but I cannot give uh, too many insights. Yeah, you can do this while you're doing a PhD, so. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, and Priam also said thank you. So I uh, think that's, yeah, I think that's okay. Um, so I don't know. I mean, there's not much else to, not much else to answer now. And I think the question and answering was also really nice. So um, I think we want to end the meetup now. I, I hope the recording lands somewhere. I think Klaus hosted the meeting. So uh, yeah, I hope it's going to be somewhere <laughs> somewhere on his hard drive or on his OneDrive. I don't know. Um, yeah, thank you, Nure, again for, for this nice talk. And also yeah. uh, to Melinda for the sponsoring and Pi and AI for the, for the sponsoring. And um, yeah, so if you want to find out more about RLZ uh, or reinforcement learning theory, just follow us on LinkedIn or on our meetup page. And um, I think we, we're gonna be quite active on LinkedIn uh, in uh, the next few weeks. And if the recording has worked for this talk, it's gonna be online as well. I mean, it's probably not much use to the ones who have been listening today, but more to the others who haven't been here today. And um, yeah. Uh, we're going to see and uh, we're going to announce the, ne the next events on uh, meetup.com or and or on uh, LinkedIn so uh, you can find all the information there and find us there so and yeah if you need to find out anything or want to contact us just do it on LinkedIn 
all our details are online, so that's really no problem. And uh, Klaus, Mark, or I are gonna gonna help you or find someone. Or if you if you have something to talk about in terms of reinforcement learning, uh, just uh, drop us a line, and then we can set up uh, our next meetup, something like today, something like the last meetups we had something practical, something theoretical, whatever. So if it's reinforcement learning, you can just uh, contact us and then uh, we can set up something like this event today. All right, um, so that's uh, any final last words from your side, Noria? No, just thanks to all of you also for the feedback and the questions and so on. So it's nice, yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Cool. Thanks thank for inviting thank me to talk to, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> okay, no worries. Yep. Oh, all right. Uh, thanks to all of you and uh, maybe see each of you next time and maybe in person. All right. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.